Let's open with prayer. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so this is my first class for this trimester. And I have to admit, I always find it difficult to teach here because of the cameras. Um, and they tend to cause a distraction for me. I don't know if they cause you a problem, but as much as possible, I try to ignore them and try and work just with this class. But it often causes problems because people don't understand the context who are watching the videos about some of the things we may or may not discuss. Um, so I've only been here a few days. I'm away most weekends. I don't know if people are aware of that. So I think I miss most Sunday classes for the whole of the trimester. And this week I miss a Thursday class as well. So I'm only here till Wednesday this week. Um, but I have two afternoon classes, Mondays and Wednesdays, where I believe I'm just going to carry on doing the studies that we're, um, that, that we're doing in the morning. Um, I, I don't know what you were told about what we're going to study or discuss during my time here, but I don't have any set direction, really. I want to, I'm not sure where the Lord's going to take us in our studies. And there are a couple of things that I do want to hopefully <coughs> discuss with you, but it's not that I have any answers. So we, we dis someone said yesterday, they're expecting some great answers from me about I know, a whole range of topics and I have no idea <coughs> why they thought that or what they were talking about. So I'm here to learn as much as everyone else is. Um, there are certain things that are happening in our movement, as you're all aware of, and I want to try and discuss some of those things. Um, <coughs> also, I want to apologise. <laughs> I've only been here a couple of days and I've already caused a number of people some heartache uh, in our discussions here out of class. So I want to apologise for that. I think sometimes people find my style of questioning or study can be either too intense, too aggressive, too threatening. I don't know what it is. It's not intended to be that way. Uh, I'm usually quite easy to get along with. But our, our class can't work the two or three people and it always seems to me the same two or three people who do all the talking. So I won't let the class run that way. I want people to participate. Um, and I know someone used the statement, pick on people. So I'm not, I don't want you to think that way, but I want us all to reason together. Um, I struggle pre pre bringing notes to class because I'm not sure what notes we're going to use. Um, so I probably won't br bring notes. So I don't know if you have some kind of computer or device or something, because we, we're going to study passages, but we study them quite slowly, and it's only be a couple. So if you don't have access to some of these quotes, uh, you might not be able to participate in the class too well. So either you've got a phone or a laptop, please bring them to class. Um, the other thing is, if we're studying the Bible, it's useful to have an electronic concordance. I don't know if everybody's got access to one of those in class. Hopefully you all do. Um, OK, I think that's about it. So, as I said, I'm not sure where we're going to go in our discussions, but there are, there are some things that I want to discuss, but they may not all be tied together in a systematic fashion. So if I do 15 minutes here, I'll tell you when that bit has stopped, and then we'll move on. But I want to bring a couple of things, a number of things, which may all seem random, and try and draw them together as we go through our classes. So if you miss classes, especially for our visitors in the afternoon, some of the things that we discussed may not make sense. Um, oh, and just one other thing. I haven't worked out the logistics of this, but I'm hoping if we can do memory verses or memory passages. Yeah? So uh, I'll give you the first one that I'd like us to do. 
It's taken from 7 BC, 971, paragraph 3. In fact, most of you may, you probably already know it. Some of you may already have memorised it. Um, so in a recent prophecy school, I spoke about uh, a passage. It's taken from Adventist Home, page 127, paragraph 2. Yesterday, Sister Kathy put a part of this passage uh, on the board in the dining hall. I'm not sure why, but uh, it generated some discussion, and then it generated some further discussion in the baby shower yesterday. So I thought it might be opportune to just discuss this a little bit, and maybe we'll come back to it. But before we go to that passage, I want to go to another one, which is Review and Herald, January the 10th. Eighteen eighty two, paragraph one. So we're going to read uh, the Review and Herald passage. I'll give you a couple of minutes to find it. No work ever undertaken by man requires greater care and skill than the proper training and education of youth and children. There are no influences so potent as those which surround us in our early years, says the wise man. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So this is the, this is the one sentence that I want to pick up. The nature of man is threefold, and the training enjoined by Solomon comprehends the right development of the physical, intellectual and moral powers. To perform this work aright, parents and teachers must themselves understand the way the child should go. This embraces more than a knowledge of books or the learning of the schools. It comprehends the practice of temperance, brotherly kindness and godliness, the discharge of our duty to ourselves, to our neighbours and to God. If you're taking notes, um, I'm, not, I'm not discussing it now, but this last sentence where it says the com it comprehends the practice of temperance, brotherly kindness and godliness. Where do we pick up that phrase, Brother Jonathan? Sorry. Where's that phrase picked up from? It comprehends the practice of temperance, brotherly kindness and godliness. If you're not sure, just say if you don't know. Sister Shamila? Chapter two. So just quickly go there. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not very good at names. Uh, so if I point to you and say brother or sister, please don't <laughs> be offended. I'll try and get familiar with your names as soon as possible. First Peter chapter 2, you said? So we pick up from verse 6. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So I don't want to make a point on that, but it, it probably come up in our studies later on. Um, what do we normally call this? We normally call it a ladder, don't we? Yeah. So we're going to see that this ladder is the same ladder as Jacob's ladder. 
um, hopefully we're going to try and tie those things together. But I just want to come back to the sentence that, we, uh, that, that I want us to focus. The nature of man is threefold, and the training enjoined by Solomon comprehends the right development of the physical, intellectual and moral powers. By the, by the way, just because I have some understanding of some of these things, or I have an opinion, it doesn't mean they're always correct. So, I'm happy to be corrected on some of these thoughts, just because they're discussed. Um, I'm not saying I have all the answers. So the development of man is three, sorry, the nature of man is threefold, and it entails, what does it say? Physical, intellectual, and moral powers. What, what does that mean to people? If I said the th nature of man is threefold, it uh, threefold it speaks about the intellectual moral and physical powers how do you understand what that means well two has to do with the mind and the heart and the other one has to do with the body okay so you're saying which, which one's which mind is intelligence okay one second the brain so here's the mind Connected to the heart, I believe the moral. That's the that's the heart. And the physical is obvious our body. The one thing I've learned in my short time studying the Bible, don't mean to make this sound bad, but when people say obviously, what first seems obvious often isn't. Yeah. So <laughs> I could be wrong. I yeah, I I I, 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 I'm not saying that you are wrong. I'm just saying when people say it's obvious. Obvious, often, what at first seems obvious isn't so obvious. That's right. Anyone else got any thoughts? When, when, if you just read this, the intellectual, moral and physical, what do we think this means? They're all tied together. Okay, so they're all tied together, obviously, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I'm thinking of the Godhead who said, um, let us make man in our image. The threefold there. Uh, you think about when the, God, the Godhead? When, yeah, the Godhead when it said, at creation, let us make man, man in our own image. And then we know there's three in the Godhead. Would you want to do that, split those into three parts or? Not necessarily, oh. but that's what I think of, okay. you know, because if it's in his image. Sorry. Uh. Sorry. Um, it, 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 I also think that each one, um, even though they're, they're separate, that they're connected, and that each one has an has a, a equal weight, that they're, 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 they're weighted together. Okay, so together. you think they're equally weighed? Think of like a, a a practical application and a spiritual application. If that makes sense. Say that again. I think of when I think of in, intellectual, moral, and physical. I think God has given us uh, the the practical side along with the. Which is the practical? Uh, I would guess it's a uh, physical. You're guessing. Like the. Uh, Applying, uh, Practical. like working in the garden, you know, that's the ABCs. Of and this is spiritual. Did you say spiritual? I want to get the words right. right. I don't want to tie you up like last time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> spiritual. Yeah? Yeah, just spiritual and practical. My memory isn't very good. Uh -huh. And nor is my spelling. <laughs> okay, let's, um, this, this, this passage is found in many different places, but we'll go to. Uh, 
Health for Living, 13.5. It's the one that uh, just came to me quickly. Um, yes. These three all are necessary in the development of character. So they're all necessary in the development of character. Um, it's the, in the develop. Where is character? Where is it? Thoughts and feelings. So where would that be? It's, it's, it's all three. It's, it's okay, so it's all three. All three yeah, I think. So we have thoughts here? She's, yeah. <coughs> Something's there because she says that um, the body is the medium by which. Uh, so do our fingers have thoughts? Sorry? Do our fingers have thoughts? No. Do our fingers have feelings? They have sensory perception, yes. they have nerve endings, but they don't actually have feelings. Right. If you chopped your finger off and put it down, it wouldn't be upset. So the char if you're talking about character, thoughts and feelings, I is it here? If this is a physical body... What is the thing? Uh, no, I'm, I'm asking my brother. If you, if you define it as thoughts and feelings... Well, I didn't... Uh, Brother Theodos, he said it's connected to thoughts and feelings. Uh, you said it's connected to character. Yeah. And he said character is thoughts and feelings. Right. Yeah? And um, you, you, you accepted had, that. So, so I'm asking where would it be? Well, that, that's, that's one way of, of defining character, but... Give me another way. Ellen White says that the uh, body is the medium by which the mind uh, can, can, is connected to... Uh, to, to heavenly things, so they have a connection that's required to develop to develop our, our character. To uh, we need the body in order to further so you, our development. To, to form so your hand <coughs> would de help develop your character. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If you chopped your hand off, would it be able to help you develop your character? Well, I'm not just talking about. Hand, but if we're, if we're dead, we can't develop our character. No, if we're not dead, we're still alive, but the hand doesn't work. Right. Is that going to develop our character? I'm just wondering who's, in, who's controlling whom. The, the mind controls the body. But you're suggesting that the, ca the body helps control the mind because it's part of the work of deve character development, the physical body itself. I'm not saying one is greater than the other, but I'm saying that... He's already said it's equal. Yeah, they're equal. I'm just asking, not, not, not greater, I'm asking which one is part of character development, because that's what you said. If you're going to make the physical body part of the character development... Yeah. It, it can't be, because if it, it was... It can't or can? It can't, it can't be, because if it was, then people who are disabled couldn't be in heaven. So if you, don't, if you have some kind of disability and it's not chopped off, then you can't have the same character development as someone who is um, fully bodily able. I think that's what Brother Clayton's saying. Yep. So what do you say to that? Uh, that's a tough one. It's, What's tough? It's, just, it's tough that um, this, I've heard this argument before like concerning a person that's uh, developmentally disabled. He said physically. He, he specifically said physically, well, not it's, mentally. It's the same thing if a person is um, mentally, ment like the mind is not fully developed. It's the same thing as saying phys physically. Is it? I think so. Um, so Stephen Hawkins, one of the greatest minds in the world, he's physically disabled, but his mind is razor sharp, yeah. which is not the same condition as someone who may have Down syndrome, who may be fully physically there. So yeah. the dynamics are different. Well, when I, say I won't pursue you. I won't pursue <laughs> you unless you want. To, unless you want to say more. Well, when I say physically, I'm still thinking the brain, the brain, the physical brain as being. So do you disagree no, with saying, this? I'm you, saying the brain. Do you disagree with this model then? Because he said that's the brain. Basically, he said that's the body. No, but I, I'm I'm thinking of the brain and the mind being two different things. Okay, so tell me how you. So this is the mind. The mind is not in a physical aspect, from my point of view. Okay, so th I put the brain there as a symbol of mind. I don't know who said that, but I assume that's what they meant. Because when they said the heart, I assume they didn't mean the physical heart. 
can't remember who did that. But this was the physical body, like limbs. So that's what I think Brother Clayton, the point he's making is, this is the limbs. So if this was part of character development, if you've got something wrong with your limbs, you wouldn't be able to develop character. If you had a mental disability, would you be able to develop character properly? Yes, but in a different way than everybody else. That's, that's, that's God's judgment. Okay, in a different way. So if you didn't have any legs, can you develop character in the same way as someone who can reason just as well as you can? Legs and reason, you're switching physical and mental there. Thoughts and feelings. Looking about the thoughts and the feelings, can you develop character if you didn't have any legs in the same way as someone else can? Yeah. Who's, yeah. Then it can't be part of character development. The physical can't be. <coughs> you can do it equally well with or without legs. But if you have a mental um, disability, then you can't develop character in the same way. Someone who's autistic cannot have empathy as well as someone who is... Uh, who doesn't have that uh, condition. I think most of us are aware of that. Or if you're, if you've got, um, if you're hyper, hyperactive, children can't sit properly, they, they, their mental development doesn't work in the same way as someone who doesn't have that condition. So that would affect character, I would suggest. We'll, we'll move on to that. I don't want to... So, sorry. Um, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 322, paragraph 2. Before you read it, tell us, uh, let me write it down and then tell us what you want us to see. Fundamentals of Christian Education, 322, paragraph 2. F C E? No. F E. F E. Mm -hmm. 2. 322. Tell us why you're reading this. Development of both physical and intellectual. Okay. She says many kinds of labor adapts to different persons may be devised. So many kinds of labor adapted to different persons may be devised. But the working of the land will be a special blessing to the worker. There is a great want of intelligent men to till the soil who will be thorough. This knowledge will not be a hindrance to the education essential for business or for usefulness in any line. To to develop the capacity of the soil requires thought and intelligence. Not only will it develop muscle, but capa capability for study, because the action of brain and muscle is equalized. We should so train the youth that they will love to work with upon the land and delight in improving it. The hope of advancing the cause of God in this country is in creating a new moral taste in love of work, which will transform mind and character. Okay, tell us what that means. Here she talks about the tilling of this soil. No, I understand that. I understand what she's talking about. What's, what's that in relation to this discussion? She's talking about the equal development of both physical and mental, which contributes to character. And so, first she says, that many kinds of labor adapted to the different persons may be devised. So yes, I may be physically <coughs> handicapped, but it doesn't mean that I cannot have labor, physical labor, which is adapted to me. So no. you disagree with, uh, I don't know who, uh, my sister. Oh. One second, Nyla's brother. One, one, sec one second, brother Clayton. Uh, my sister, uh, I'm asking you. Because you, you disagree with what she's saying, I think, before you agreed with Brother Clayton. No, I agree. Oh, you agree with her? Yep. Sister Shimela, you had... I was just saying there's an impairment if you're disabled or handicapped. There's an impairment to um, that full development of character. Okay. I don't think anybody disagrees that the interaction of the mind and body is there and that what you do in the physical body affects you. And I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that. Uh, I want to read another passage, but Brother Clayton. Well, I just, the way I understood what she said is that there's, there's labor for everyone. You know, there may be less for somebody who has less and, you know, more for somebody who has more capabilities. 
where, whereas, and I see what you said where they're tied together, the physical, but I don't agree in that scenario <clears throat> that that's required the physical side at all. And the reason why is because someone like Nyla can't, can't do physical labor whatsoever, but she could be a, 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 she's an absolute wonderful Christian in person. That's not physical labor. I've been doing this for 21 years, and that's not physical labor. So my, my point is, is that I, I don't agree with that necessarily because there are some people that are disabled too much to where they can't do physical labor, but they can progress their character. I'm not, I'm not going to move on with that. I want to, I want to shift on because it's... I want to go to... Um, oh, the nature of man. So what, what is the intellectual, moral and physical? What is that? By definition, it's a definition of a man. Do you agree with that? So, so all of this is what a man is. Yes? Okay, so maybe that seems so, too obvious. So let me read Healthful Living 13.5. We have special duties resting upon us. We should be acquainted with our physical structure and the laws controlling natural life. Greek, Latin, which are seldom of any advantage, are made a study by many. Physiology and hygiene are barely touched upon. The study to which to give thought is that which concerns natural life and knowledge of oneself. It is the house in which we live that we need to preserve, that we may do honour to God who has redeemed us. So that's all I wanted to... Uh, and I'll read the next one. We need to know how to preserve the living machinery that our soul, body and spirit may be consecrated to his service. As, a rash, as rational beings, we are deplorably ignorant of the body and its requirements. So all I want to pick up is, if you've got it on your computers, there's a, a knowledge of oneself, dot, dot, dot. It is the house in which we live. What does that mean? Um, it is the house in which we live. So before I'm asking what it is, uh, sorry, what does it mean? What is she referring to? Sister Cathy? Our bodies. Do we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. She's talking about the body. So in this sentence, when it says it, what is the it? Spirit. So you said this is the spirit. Sister Shamila, Shamila said it's the body. So maybe we need to read it carefully. Brother Luke, what is the it? I'd probably say what Larry. The spirit? Brother Theodore? It's just a, the house is defining what it is. So, if, you, if you're just looking at the sentence without knowing anything. Okay, so you want to make it the house. The house. The house okay. Is just, okay, I was, I was going. I want to. I will try and go that way. With so. <laughs> I know, but I'm just saying. Yes, yes, I agree with you. So the house in which we live. That's what we're trying to define. We know the it is. The house in which we live is just saying what the it is. That's what it says. It is. Okay. <laughs> My sister. Physical structure. Physical structure. So I've got house. Physical. It says it in the, in, the, in the sentence above. We should be acquainted with our physical structure. Mm -hmm. This wasn't the best of passages, but there, there are other ones because it's got the, the dots in front of it, so it doesn't give you the sentence before. But it's if you check the context, it's not. It, it's a it's a fair enough statement. Uh, my sister, what is the it? I would have said the, the, the physical structure, the temple. I would mm -hmm. have said the dwelling, the house, is what we're living in. Okay, so you've got the physical structure in the house. Sister Sarah? You confused me. I've confused you. <laughs> I've already yeah, put a sentence <laughs> up here and I'm asking who the it no, is. Maybe the body, because you, you, you put there the body is equals it is the house. 
Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Actually, it's there already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's and the physical is the body, yeah. according to the three. So, you're saying it's that this this one, mm. yeah. Anyone else? Who said spirit? Do you want to change? You don't want to change. Well, so explain why it is. So l let's do the sentence. The spirit is the house in which we live. If it was to say house, if it was house, it would say house is the house in which we live. That doesn't make sense to me. Okay, so now we're going to get into grammar. <laughs> so you're saying house is the house in which we live. That doesn't make sense. To what, why doesn't that make sense? Because that's correct, isn't it? Because the reason we use pronouns is, and we become so familiar with them, that when we don't use pronouns, our sentences look funny. So if we said... No, I won't give an example. It, it would be silly. So, you think that it is the spirit? You think that it is different to the house? That's what I'm thinking. My sister, you had your hand up. Oh, no. oh, oh sorry, I thought you did. <laughs> Anybody else think it's the spirit? My sister. I think it is the living machinery. And, and what is the living machinery? The body. The body. Brother Larry, what are you saying? Okay. It's a good idea. You're in the back foot now. My sister. If it were different than the body, then we would be living in ourselves. But it says. Oh, wait there. That was too fast. If it was, what are you saying it is? That, the body. So you're saying it's the body, now you said, if it was... The spirit. If it was not the body... Correct. Then the sentence would read, we would live in ourselves. By the sentence saying, the house is in which we live, that means that there is a, a bigger contextual essence in which we are housed. Okay, I thought you were going to say container. <laughs> which, 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 okay, Brother Larry, yeah. who's we? Uh, yeah. The individual. Can I use the word man? Yes. Okay, so we'll change the we to man. So now read the sentence. It is, he it is the. the Okay, so what is the house in which a man lives? <coughs> His body. So that it must be the body. Are we okay with that, everybody? Yep. So, let's come back to here. What's the definition of man? All of these three things. We agree with that? So, is this the body in this diagram? So if this was the body, and this was the definition of man, you've got the problem that my sister just said. We're living in ourselves. Because isn't that what you said? And is that right or wrong, to live in yourself? Because I thought you said it's, that's bad. Well, n no, just the way of looking at it, because there is a delineation between the, the body, the temporal aspect, and the, the substance, the we the perception of self. Did everybody get that? <coughs> Did anybody not understand what she said? So some people aren't understanding what you're saying. If you can simplify that. Before she does, uh, this model that you've developed here is different to this one. They're not the same. I don't know if we can see that. There's a problem. The body doesn't identify with itself. That's an intellectual property. No, I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> that makes it worse, if I can body speak on, some, on, the, on their behalf. Not intellectual property. The body and mind being separate entities. Okay. We, you don't, there's no mind in this. So the, the we, the... Which is? The self, the... Can we call it man? Are you not, if you're not happy to call it man, I won't. The, 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 the man and the... Body. Are what? Separate. 
Does everybody agree that's what that sentence says? The body and the man are separate. No, they're integrated. Okay, they may be in, they're integrated, but are they separate and distinct? Mm -hmm. The body and the mind are two separate. Th the body and the man. No. No. Brother Clayton, uh, do you agree or disagree that <laughs> the body is the house in which the man lives? Uh, you know, look, since I don't have the, my laptop, I obviously failed. I can't read all of the context. I can only see just that right there, so it's, it's, that's difficult to answer. I mean, I would want to read into it a little bit in front of me, and then I'd be able to understand the passage better, but I can't with how we've hacked it up here. If, if you can take my word for it, the context, context wouldn't help. Okay. It's, it's a, it, it, it's, it, won't, it won't actually change what we're saying, okay. because all we're doing, all it's going to define is, no, I don't think it would help. Um, <coughs> brother. I think I get what something Allison was saying. Mm -hmm. so, Do you agree uh, with her? Alyssa. Well, in, in her expression, that's what I'm trying to clarify. I think it's like if you, if you built a house, right? The house itself doesn't know it's a house, right? It's, it's just, it's wood, it's metal, it's uh, electricity, you know, electrical components. But the person that lives in the house, it knows that the house is a house. So, can I just um, stop you there? Uh -huh. So now you're saying, but I didn't finish based upon this senten sentence, mm -hmm. here's the house, mm -hmm. and you're inside the house. Yes. So you and the house are two separate things. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that oh. the intellectual side would be the knowledge of what this house is. And the intellectual side would tell you that this house needs a strong foundation. It needs to be built proportionally. It's built for a, a purpose, a function. And it would tell you that your walls can't be built at 45 degrees. You know, they have to be perpendicular to the ground. So the, the, so so the you and the house aren't two separate things? No, what I'm saying, they are. They're, they're one. In, in that yeah, sense. so they're not separate. You're saying they're the same thing. Yes, but no, what I'm saying is that if we're breaking down the intellectual and the physical, what I'm saying, the physical side would be the, the, the sentence, would be the intellect. The sentence says, the body is the house. Do we all agree with that? Do we all agree that the body, body equals house? So everyone agrees with that. So let me take this out then. So let's draw the house. Do we agree that that is the house? Yes. Where is the man? Because you live in it. You live in that house. Mm -hmm. So where, would, where, where are you? The intellect and the, the moral side is the, the knowledge that God gives you. I, 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 I'll just do it like this. Are you here? No. no. <laughs> where are you? You are. So you're here. No. No. Here. I just I, I, I don't want to. I, it, I'm not trying to say we're in the body, but you're inside the body. Yeah. Just want to, that's what that's the only point I'm making. This is you. So this sentence says you are inside this. Do you agree with that? Yes. As of now, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what you were saying? You are inside the house. Yeah. And she said, did that make sense, Sister Serena? She said intellectual property or intellectual... Like the, the what was the phrase awareness. you used? The awareness. But what was the phrase you said? Intellectual... I okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think she said intellectual rights or intellectual property. She says you own this collateral. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Just like a normal car. You sit in the car, the car isn't you. You own that car, mm -hmm. but it's not you. No what, sorry? No what? Just as how you just placed it, that you own the car, the car is not you. But we cannot say that our bodies is not ourselves. Okay, because I think this sentence says that it, that it, exactly that, that it is not yourself. Because this sentence says the body is not you. It's something that you live in. The reason why this becomes an important issue, if you go back into the time of 
the Millerites and Ellen White, they were having arguments about this issue. And if I can say it in a foolish way, the argument kind of runs like this. If this arm were cut off from you, and this arm is you, so this is you, <laughs> and it's part of it, yeah? No, no, yeah, I mean, it sounds funny, but, but it's a serious thing. You get eaten by a shark, or you get burnt or destroyed. So this then, all the elements of that hand or that arm get distributed somewhere, yeah? Because nothing gets created or destroyed. So, somewhere in this world, Adam is here. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? Adam's physical body is here. Those atoms, those elements are here. So if that was Adam, when he gets resurrected, what does God need to do? If that's Adam. He needs to get all of those elements, okay? So the problem is that if this person died a few weeks ago, those elements are actually part of a fish now or a shark or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the argument that people began to develop is that this whole thing is <coughs> problematic to say the least if we're going to keep our physical body as part of us. <coughs> and Ellen White cuts this argument down, she basically says it's all foolishness because these physical bodies that we've got are actually not us. Because if they were us, we'd get into a lot of problems when we think, we think about the second advent and we're going to receive immortality. Mm -hmm. Because then you've got problems. Because if you've got atoms that are you, and those atoms come together as molecules or whatever, and they become DNA, that DNA structure is damaged. We, do we all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah? Through genetic mutation, we might call it sin, our DNA has been damaged. So if you just got that DNA and brought it back, it wouldn't be the same, it wouldn't be fit for purpose. So that's why we're going to get new bodies. <coughs> B Brother Tyler. The only thing you take with you to heaven is your character and your thoughts and wherever it was your, it was your, it wasn't your body. You're not, the only thing you don't take to heaven is your body. But you take your thoughts, your feelings, your your intellectual capacity at that time, I guess. Maybe not capacity, because that's that's physically attached, but... Okay, so... You take your character. This comes back to the question that so my brother was bringing before. When we talk about character development, which is thoughts and feelings, is if it's housed here, then this physical body that we've got has to be connected to our transition from earth to heaven. We have to take the physical with us if character development is housed in the physical body in, at some level. That's why I was asking that question before, because if you put it that way, then the argument that you're making, if, we, if all we take is our character, and character is thoughts and feelings, and the thoughts and feelings are housed somewhere in the physical, we have to take the physical up to heaven, and you begin to get into this, this philosophical problem when you engage or connect the body with the you. Why do we have to take the physical? Because that's where the thoughts and feelings are housed, if it's in the physical. But it, it's corrupt, it's, it's human fallen nature, but we need the, we need the, the, the physical aspect to, to connect to God. God. God came down, you know, Christ came down to earth as a man so that he could connect. I, I totally agree with that. If, if you lost an arm and you had a should you call it a prosthetic? Yeah? They, they've got the technology now, if you haven't seen sort of these scientific uh, you know, sci-fi movies, that they can connect your nerve endings to mechanical bits and pieces in that arm. And you can make those fingers work. Yeah? So there's a mind-physical relationship, even between something that's mechanical. You all agree with that? But you would know that at the end of the day, if you do that, I don't know what they do, that you could take that arm and put it on the side of your bed, and that arm is no longer you, is it? It can't do anything. It's only when you connect the thoughts and the feelings to that false arm that you can get the fingers to move. 
So there is a mind-body interaction, but the arm, that false arm, isn't you. It's not what you're going to take to heaven. But those thoughts and feelings you certainly will take to heaven. I, I agree with all that, but we need the body to develop character. Uh, Brother Clayton, you say no. I have a totally unrelated question then, because I, I agree with the point that you're making here with the, you know, if the shark takes the arm and he's off in the Atlantic Ocean, and I, I, I get that, okay? That it's not. The part that I can't correlate, that I don't understand, is the, the uniqueness of the 144,000. See, they still, they not they have their bodies, and it's still that, that DNA that's messed up. So, I don't, I mean, it doesn't make sense that, that one's disconnected, but the other one's not. When you say the 144,000... Right, well, they're not, they're, they don't have one of their arms in a shark somewhere to bring back. So, they, they have all that failed DNA still, too, with what you said. You said that the mind is disconnected from the body in a way that when the people, are, Adam's resurrected because he's here on Earth, they're not going to go pull all of his parts from all kinds of different places to make Adam, right? So, I think what's behind your question, or, or thought, is that at the second advent, the people who are living in, on earth, what happens to their physical body? There you go. Is it the same, is that physical body the same one? That's right. So here I am, second advent, Jacob's time of trouble, when Jesus comes and I'm changed in the twinkling of the eye, what is changing? Right, that's my question. The physical. Okay, so, but is it the same DNA? Is it the same person or is it something totally new? The same person, not the same body. But the person is the same. So they say that, that it, you, get, you actually do get a new body. Yes. Or you get some workers there and they reconnect or re-sort out all of that DNA but they can do that because the DNA is not you. It's just the house in which you live. So you can get your car fixed up. It's not a problem. At the twinkle of an eye, the 144,000 can get their DNA sorted out, whether it's that one that they've got or whether it's some piece of dust over here for Adam. Everything can be sorted out because if you disconnect the physical from you, there's not a problem in doing that. So God could, God could come miraculously, because he's a carpenter or a, or a roofer, he can come and sort out your body, even if you're 144,000, because the body isn't you. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start making the body you, you get into many problems, which is the problem that you're identifying. But if you keep the disconnect, even if you're living, and you weren't, if you've still got the same arm, he can still go in and change that arm into something that's correct and correct all that DNA damage and sort it all out because the DNA is not you. There's an interaction between them but they're not you. So we've got a large class here and I'm not sure if we've moved too quickly that I've got everybody on board because I don't want to move ahead if we don't agree. I'm saying that the body is the house. Here it is. The body is the house and this house is what we, the man, lives in. Just in that state. And I've put it here as a, in a kind of a crass pictorial fashion that you are here and this is the body. Yeah? Do we agree with that? Brother Theodore, I think you had your hand up. Or you? Yeah. So, when we look at the threefold nature of man, we know that who we are is our thoughts and our feelings which is the mind and the heart, right? But the physical part of us is a part of what we are on this earth in order to, to be a being, but the physical is not us. We're describing, in a sense, two different ways of looking at ourselves. So obviously, we talk about the mind, the heart, and the body, the soul, the spirit, all these different things in the body, all together as a unit. But that's... The mind can, controls the body. The body doesn't control the mind. Okay, so if we're going to use that analogy, <clears throat> this is you and this is your body, okay? 
I don't like doing this. Even if you haven't watched the movies, and I'm <coughs> sure we haven't, you know, it's pervasive in our society. We all know about these things. Okay, so is this, this, is this your body? No, this is not your body. This is a robot. And here you are inside this robot in a little room on a chair, like here, like this, and you've got all these controls. Yeah? So you pull a lever and what happens to the robotic arm? It starts moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So we've all seen sci you know sci-fi movies like that, whatever you call them, Transformers and all Yeah? You've got people who are controlling these things. And this is this is real life today, isn't it? What do we what are these called? They're called exo, exo skeletons now, yeah? They, they, we know this works, and they're trying to develop it for the army so that soldiers can now run, you know, 50 miles a day because they get into the... and they've got these bionic legs, if, you know, because they've got mechanical assistance. So it's that concept that I want us to... if it's correct, I think it is, to see that this is you controlling this robot. And if you're in a battle, and the robot loses his leg, you're not bothered. Because what's going to happen at the end of the day? Someone's either going to repair it, or you come out of that robot and go into what? Just a different robot, yeah? A different mechanical assistance. Are we all in agreement with that? Yeah? Brother Tyler? Agree? Okay, so if we all agree with that, which is all of this. So we've agreed on this. Let's come back to this. If this is the definition of man, yeah, I'm going to put, I'm gonna, let me take this out. <coughs> and now I'm going to do this. By the way, when we did this, this was, um, I'm going to put NP, non-physical. I don't know who, who, who did that. But they said it was the mind, so that's non-physical. But I've pictured it as a as a brain, and the heart. We know it's not this pumper, yeah. So is this non-physical as well? Yes. Okay. So can you begin to see where the problem's going to arise? So let's go here. We've got the heart, which is non-physical, non-physical. What is this? It says the word physical, it says the word physical, but what is this? Is it physical or non-physical? Who said that? You said non-physical. Anybody else? <coughs> is anybody saying it's physical? Yeah. I, 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 no, I know the word says physical. I know the word says physical. I'm just saying, take the concept and maybe have righteousness by faith. <laughs> have some faith and be right. Unless there are two different, two different definitions for the same word. I don't know how you if, if, it's, if it is physical, then we contradict everything we just did on the yeah. bottom there. I want us to see that. Amen. So we, we get problems if we just read things at face value. And I know we say we've got to read things just as they're written, and we, you know, we make that assertion often, and then other times we say, maybe we don't, maybe we have to understand the context of, what it, of what's being discussed. But if this becomes physical, and this is the body, you're going to say that the body is the house in which the body lives, which was the problem that you originally had an issue with. Mm -hmm. Brother Clayton. So you're saying that the physical is non-physical? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I hate to say you're saying you're asking me. Am I? That's that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to follow through with the logic of this. I just uh, I'm not advanced as you and Tyler, obviously. Can you explain to me then why the physical is is non-physical in this context? I don't understand. Okay. Yeah, but ignore the word. Okay. Ignore the word. Go with the concept. If if this is if th threefold nature of man is not intellectual, moral, and physical, it's intellectual, moral, uh, moral and X. So, so throw the word away and make it X. Okay. Would X, by this definition, be physical or non-physical? Non. It would have to be non-physical. Mm -hmm. 
but we're being funneled into making it physical because of the word. I don't agree with that. You don't. You do or you don't. I, I don't. Because she says, th "This is God got it, Sister White." And so she used the word physical. So unless we have <coughs> another quote or reference that tells us that physical doesn't mean physical, I don't understand how we can not make it physical. And I'm saying that because God's mind is infinite, our minds are finite. But if God uses the word physical, how could we not say it's physical? So that I think our, our understanding is the one lacking, not what it says up there. I don't think we should change physical to X. She, she clearly says physical. Okay, so part of the way I teach, part of the way our class is going to run, is we're, we're going to confront this issue over and over again that you're going to think I'm ignoring the spirit of prophecy and if it says no, that, if it, no, 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 I'm just saying generally, I've had this, not, not just we do, that I'm saying I'm prepared to run with the structure and the logic and many people feel uncomfortable with doing that and this isn't just a problem in this class, you know, you, like you suggested, if she says it, she says it and our minds are finite and hers are infinite. This is the argument that the church has against us over and over again, the argument that people say is that you have to read the spirit of prophecy as written and our argument is, no, you let the lines guide you. You know, the reform lines, the lines guide you and they direct you. So, I'm not saying this is a line, but, but the point I want to make by that is I've got a spirit of prophecy quote here and I've got another one here and I think I know what they mean because I understand English and it says <coughs> Sunday law or it says physical or it says whatever it says and then we come along these Daniel 11 people and we draw a line and everybody thought this was I'll say it the Sunday law and this was at the close of probation and now we come around and say by the way you've misplaced this all this information doesn't mean what you think it means and the only way you're ever going to figure that out is by getting this thing and placing it upon a line and if this was the Sunday law you're saying this passage actually isn't Sunday law it actually goes here and you can develop an argument to show that but it's all about rhetoric and logic and you know, we, we, I think, unwittingly use these techniques, this methodology, when we engage with the church, we start shifting and moving things, and people become jittery, saying, you guys are into fanaticism, you're teaching error, because you're moving things that Ellen White clearly establishes. So, you know, one of the things that, that we all know about is public evangelism. Yeah? I mean, I don't know how any of you, us, are going to fight against a 500-page book called Evangelism. But we do, we, we get the whole body of work and we just trash it. And, it's, and that trashing is all based upon logic, it's all based upon the lines. Then we start drawing in all of these different thoughts and ideas. And we don't actually go with what Ellen White is saying in its proof text in way, you know, just as an individual statement, we say we have to understand, not even the context in which she was placing it, but her words have to be guided and directed by historical events or parables or stories. So I understand it says physical, but I'm not using anything different to the techniques and the methodology that we already currently use. So I know it's causing us consternation at the moment, but I'm just going through with, the, with where this logic would take you that if you make this the body, you start having spirit prophecy quotes that start fighting and warring against one another. Hopefully, if, if we're doing it this right, we, we will be able to try and explain what this is by applying other spirit prophecy quotes to it. But just at this surface level, I want us just to see if you made this the physical body, you've got now a contradiction. And so what I want us to do is obviously try and resolve the contradiction but I wanted us to see it that this contradiction exists and it's the same issues that we face 
with the church because we shift everything that is back here and what are we doing with it? We're moving it all closer. I don't know if it's forward or backwards really. I'm going to say backwards because forwards is forwards. We're moving it closer and closer to ourselves and we develop a logic and a reason for that. So we have to change our thinking, I believe, in the way we interact with the church. And we need to understand what their problem is with us. And I think sometimes we don't see that. I think sometimes we haven't thought about what is their problem with us and why don't we able to get through to them? Because they've got a different way of thinking. Um, that's too much preaching. Who's got questions? Or uh, Brother Clayton, Brother Theodore. So do you derive the, the non-physical because it starts with the definition, this is the nature of man? Is that how you're getting to that being non-physical in this context? Because I'm, I'm, I'm getting a point because the other two are and we're keeping, that makes sense to me. But how did you derive that originally? I'm just saying it says man. Yep. Not picking up the, 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 the thing of nature. Um, so man is, got th is, is composed of three elements. Okay. And she says the word intellectual, moral and physical. So I let the class <laughs> define what that was. And you're going to be funneled to draw this picture because of the word. Yep. So I said, okay, that's good. That's all we had. That's the model that you'd get. But then it becomes problematic because now you've got spiritual and practical or physical and non-spiritual. And now we're defining man in a way that I don't think is scriptural. When we define man, and I don't mean a living soul, I understand about living souls, but we're not defining a man in the way that Ellen White is going to define it and scripture. And she's going to guide us and direct us that man is something different. So I went, I went to this one that says a man lives in a house. This, this sentence is really easy to see and we all agree that the house is the body and we're not the body. We know about people who die, we know people who have physical disabilities, we even know about the 144,000. If you separate the two, all the arguments that Victorian Adventists were struggling with all get resolved. But we still have the same hang-ups as they do. Now we don't say or it has to be the same physical atoms or whatever. You know, we might be beyond that, but what we're not beyond is the separation of the physical, this body, this house, from who and what we are. But if you don't disengage them, you get into problems. Because if it's part of you, if this physical entity is part of you, you have to take it to heaven with you. You're forced to come to that conclusion, I think. So, that's why this makes sense, but the problem is we're struggling here is because she uses the word physical. So I want to try and go to another statement to try and begin to explain what I think she's referring to. But I'm saying the logic tells you it can't be a physical body. It has to be non-physical. Brother Theodore. So, there's just a statement just of Ellen White's dealing with at least what I think results it, but you might have another statement. Uh, those who have not brought the lower passions into subjection, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, let, let's leave that. Let's, let me direct the class a little bit more. Do, well, give us the reference, but I don't want to read well, it quite yet. This is Adventist Home, A.H. Adventist Home. Yeah. Uh, what page? Um, yeah, 327.1. Okay, I want to go back to the Adventist Home 127, paragraph 2, before we, before we address that one. So if that's okay. We might not even get to, to your one in class. But it's uh, 327 paragraph 1. Does everybody see what the problem is? Mm -hmm. I know people are disagreeing. Uh, to take sin to heaven is what the problem is? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. if, you ha if the physical body is connected and it is one, you have to take that. If it's, Then you would have to take sin to heaven then, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. uh, that's one of the conclusions that you'd have to come to. <coughs> because, no, let me put it a different way. Let me put it a different way. We know we can't take sin to heaven. So here you are, and you've got this hand. So here's this finger, and when you were born, you only had half, you only had half a thumb, okay? 
or it, dist it got distorted, or they had some problem. So when you're going to go to heaven, what needs to happen? Restored. Needs to be restored, because we're not going to get to heaven with, with maimed parts. No. Do you have any ability to do that? Because no. you don't have any ability to do that. So that means if this is part of you, God needs to come in existentially or miraculously and start sorting things out for you. And I don't think that happens. I don't think that we have that, 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 that we have models to show that God comes outside of you against your will, against your consent even, and starts sorting things out for you. It all has to be done through consent. But if this hand, if this thumb isn't you, he can do that. He has, he, he has the right to do that because it's not you. He's not messing around with what you are here. You is you. <clears throat> and he's coming to sort things out which aren't you. And he's, he has that authority. But if it's you, you might say, I like my thumb like this. What gives you the right to change that or move it without my permission? Because we now take, we, we now lose autonomy if we make the body ourselves. So I'm not saying we take sin to heaven, but potentially we could, in the sense that will. Goes away. A, a, a maimed thumb is, is the consequences of sin. So you could take that to heaven, but it wouldn't be what God would want. So to answer your question, yes, but I probably wouldn't phrase it that we take sin to heaven. Sister Shamila. Um, <coughs> it, it is um, to do with what Brother Clayton just said. Um, so, if we use the word physical, is that, in a sense, applying it to the kind of human nature, not the uh, divine nature? So, we would be, if we say physical, we're not looking at the divine as we should be, um, and heavenly, um, you know, heavenly mind, to be heavenly minded, but we're looking at the earthliness of, you know, so there's no, there's no distinction if we, if we point out the word physical. So if, if we look at... Perhaps I'm not, not... We're not separating the two, the, phys, um, the divine and the human, if we use the word physical. I think what's throwing me is because you're using the, the, the phrase divine and human, and I'm not sure what that means. Because... We're supposed to be, um, the both, as, um, that, that is what we're supposed to be made up of, divine and human, um, but if we're using the word physical, it, it sort of goes more towards, it's leaning towards more being human, <coughs> the human, physical, um, structure. Maybe. Uh, I, I still not fully. Does anybody else? Do you mean spiritual instead of divine? <coughs> Sorry. Do you mean spiritual instead of the word divine? Or spiritual? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you think of physical, you you would think of just the human nature. That's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't see how physical is. Um, connected to the divine. I don't think, I mean, Christ was a physical being when he was here on earth, but he, he was a divine being. He wasn't just, he wasn't just a human being. That's what I'm trying to say. He was more than a human. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm probably not expressing my words correctly. My thoughts. Let's go with th this um, Adventist Home 127, paragraph 2. I don't, we probably won't get finish this now, because uh, I've delayed us. We'll read it first. Are we all there? Adventist Home. <coughs> the lower passions have their seat in the body <coughs> and work through it. The word flesh, or fleshly, or carnal lusts embrace the lower corrupt nature. The flesh of itself cannot act contrary to the will of God. We are commanded to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. How shall we do it? Shall we inflict pain on the body? No. 
but to put to death the temptation to sin. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. Every thought is to be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. All animal propensities are to be subjected to the higher powers of the soul. The love of God must reign supreme. Christ must occupy an undivided throne. Our bodies are to be regarded as his purchased possession. The members of the body are to become the instruments of righteousness. <clears throat> so, if we were just reading this sort of devotionally, it's a really nice statement. It's encouraging. There's, there's lots of good things in here. But I want us to break the passage down a little bit to try and understand some thoughts. I wouldn't, really, I wouldn't normally do it this way, but <clears throat> let me ask this question. In Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, sorry, 26, no, 24 to 30, there's a parable of the wheat and tares. Mm -hmm. We're all familiar with that. <coughs> now parables are complex things and I don't explain everything about the parable but let's see what we can quickly sort of make of, the, of this. Um, you, you don't need to read the passage because not, it's not going to be that difficult because we're all familiar with it. Yeah? Before we go to that one, are we all familiar with this statement? I'm going to make a bad job of it. The everlasting gospel is the work of Christ. Yeah? How does that go? The everlasting gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message that does what? First develops and demonstrates Okay. We, we did the, we, you did it worse than I did. <laughs> Not all of you. Two classes. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So we see these two classes over and over again. So show me some two classes. Wheat and tears. Gold and dross. Um, gold and dross. Sheep and goats, wise and foolish, sorry, good fish, bad fish, good fish, bad fish, precious and the vile. If I scribble it, you can't see my bad spelling. <laughs> Precious and the vile. Wicked and righteous. <coughs> Clean and unclean. <coughs> unjust. Just and unjust. Holy, unholy. I'm going to start asking for Bible verses. <coughs> so if you do these like holy and unholy ones, I'm going to say, where's that found? <laughs> um, line of Christ? Judas and the disciples. So can I just do that? 11 and 1? We would know what that means. Yeah. Okay. So we'll 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 stick with these ones. Um, <coughs> my brother, precious and vile. Where's that found? Um, Just a book, if you don't know. Uh, um, Jeremiah. So it's Jeremiah. Anyone? Cain and 
and Abel's in Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 15. Twenty-five. We'll do this one first. Precious and vile. Jeremiah. Oh, the verse. Oh, Fifteen, nineteen. Fifteen, nineteen. Good. <laughs> We're not going to do all of them. Just a few. No, nineteen. 19. Sorry. Jeremiah fifteen nineteen, um, and we've got the wheat and the tares is Matthew thirteen. So we'll do that one. Uh, that one. <coughs> Good fish, bad fish. Good fish, bad fish. Not sure? Okay. Matthew 13. This is 24 to 30. And the good fish, bad fish. Just pick that one up. So I think it's the very, at the very end. 47 to 50. Okay. The 11 and the 1, we won't put a Bible verse to it. <coughs> so, do we agree that there's two classes? So all these <coughs> examples. Yes? Everybody agree with that? So let's come to the wheat and tares. So let's start counting all the people or the groups or the entities in this. <coughs> so you've got wheat and you've got tares. Who else is there? Servants. You've got servants. Householder. Householder. There's one more. The harvesters. The reapers. the reapers. So you've got five. You've got five people there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so who's the householder? Sorry. God. God is the householder. Are we, do we all agree that God is the householder? Mm -hmm. Angels are the husbandmen. Sorry. The husbandman in the wheat and tares. The. So who who is that? Because husband is just a, is, is just another symbol, so it's God. Yeah. Okay. Is it always God? No. It's not always God. No. Because God lends His land to the husbandmen, like in the vines. But, you know, Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to put parable upon parable. We'll just stick with this parable. You said always, and it's not always husbandmen. In this parable. Okay. In this parable, not in another one, in this parable, that owner of the farm, is it always God? Mm -hmm. Do we agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. In this parable. Yes. Sorry? Yes. In this parable? Yeah, just in this parable. Yes. Yes. Just in this yes. parable. You're getting nervous already. <laughs> Matthew 13. Matthew 13, yeah. 24 to 30. <laughs> this hat. I don't know, did it say householder? What does it call him? Householder. Is that always God? Yeah? Okay, so... Just think about this, because this is not the point I want to make. I just want to say, you know, sometimes you say it's obvious, and you say like you have to read things as they are. So, what does Jesus ever do? He ever liveth? To make intercession for us. To make intercession for us, yeah? Does he sleep? Night or day? Okay, so he never sleeps. Did the householder sleep in this parable? Yes. He said one, never no. slept. Yes. So he's, he, he's, is he sleeping or is he not sleeping? Not so if he wasn't sleeping, what's he doing? Sorry, he's doing what? Watching over. So he's watching over the field and he says, come a long way, enemy. I don't mind you messing my field up. <coughs> Is that what we're suggesting? No. So was he sleeping or was he not sleeping? Sorry? So if he's not sleeping, he must be guarding. And if he's guarding, then he's a dog that doesn't bark. <laughs> my brother. If, if you look at it, he's got a loud sin to manifest mm -hmm. for a purpose. Mm -hmm. 
even if it happens. Okay, I, un I understand that, but, but I'm asking a, a more direct and pointy question. Does the householder sleep? Because no. No. Yeah. <coughs> if he didn't sleep, he would be a dog, a dumb dog that doesn't bark, which is a bad watchman. Right. And then he turns around and blames the other people. Like, you're supposed to be sleeping, and why did he not set an alarm if he was awake? So the question, I don't want to get into that, but just the reason why I mentioned that point is that often we have tunnel vision, and because in Jesus' explanation of these, uh, these verses, further down, it's, Alan White's going to tell you, he's going to tell you straight out that this is God, a good man. Yeah? Is it good or bad to sleep on duty and let enemies come and wreak havoc to your field? It's bad. And he allowed that to happen because he was asleep as well. Sorry? Okay, so, so go, with the inter go with the logic of that because I know you're going to maybe struggle with that. If he was awake, that's even worse. No, I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> If he, was awake, if he was awake and he sees someone coming to wreck his field, what kind of a householder is that? It's the, but we have to apply that it? to heaven then, right? No, we have to go with the physical logic, uh, the physical literal first, because that's how we understand the spiritual. But it physically happened in heaven. The what did? Happened in heaven. Okay. Satan. While Christ was sleeping in no, heaven, no, no, while the no, no. Godhead was sleeping, Satan was doing all of this stuff. That's my point. And God wasn't sleeping. Now, the, if, if, if the householder is God, God wasn't sleeping in heaven. He full well knew what was going on. But he allowed these things to, tran to transpire. So who was the enemy that brought tears into the field in heaven? But Satan. But Satan was the tear. Yeah. But sin. But sin started in him. Right. So the enemy is the tear. We don't teach that in that parable. The parable doesn't show, even show that. <laughs> the enemy and the tear are two separate entities. But isn't the householder and the watchman it. two separate entities too? So the householder was doing what? It's a long business. It's going away in a long business. Okay, that was, I'm not worried about that point, but there's five people, five groups, yeah? So we'll make the householder God. That's fine, yeah? And in the present context, the reapers aren't even there. No. We agree with that? Mm -hmm. So how many groups have you got? <coughs> seven tears and wheat. Got seven tears and wheat. So you've got three groups. Can we see that? So if you've got the wheat and tears, who are the servants? God's people. Sorry? God's people. So now we've got not two classes, we've got three classes. Yeah, they're part of the wheat. The wheat now. <coughs> so servant is the wheat. Okay, so I'm not trying to get us to, to run through that too much, but we, we, we state that it's two classes and you've already got three. So let's run down to this one. How many groups have you got here? Good fish, bad fish, fishermen. and the fishermen. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't put three groups, I should put servant here. And we've got fishermen here. <coughs> so who's the fisherman? Yeah, Sorry? Christ said to his disciples, I'll make you fishers of men. So who's the good fish? I'll answer you, but I'll tell you in context. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave that then. Precious and vile, how many groups? Two or three? Cool. But what are they, how many groups are they? We, I mean, we're without reading the passage because I think we're familiar with it. Three, who's the third one? Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we'll go with this one here. The eleven and the one. How many groups? Three. Who's the third person? Christ. Would so, the servant be in one <coughs> of the two groups? 
or the fisherman or your Jeremiah when they fall into one of the two categories? Okay, so oh, uh, I'm not trying to go run through that and, say, and show the implic the where it ends up being, but I just want to show, show us the implication that we took two classes and we've got one, two, three, four, they're not the only four, there's, there's a number of other ones, where we've got three groups, these parables are teaching three groups, really clearly, and some of the other ones that we haven't really discussed, if you dig deeper, they do as well. I don't know if you want to add this, this but Ezekiel 9, you see kind of a similar thing. So you've got s sighing and crying, and you've got abominations, and you've got the man with the ink horn. Three groups. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we, we know upon the testimony of two things established. So we've got one, two, three, four. We've got five testimonies here. There, there are more than that. So I want us to see that you've got this issue between two and three. Are we okay with that? So let's come back to Adventist home. The nature of man is what? Threefold. Are we okay with that? So let's... We're going to... We, we won't finish this now, but I just want to pick up two, two phrases here. The lower passions have their seat in the body and work through it. So she speaks about the lower passions. Whatever they are, and work through the body. Um, I'm going to skip down a couple of uh, sentences. We are commanded to crucify the flesh with the affections of lust. How shall we do it? Shall we inflict pain on the body? No. But put to death the temptation to sin. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. Every thought is to be brought into captivity to Christ Jesus. All animal propensities are to be subjected to the higher powers of the soul. So, I'm just picking up two phrases. She talks about lower and higher powers of the soul. So the first thing I want to just pick up that, if it says lower and higher, is that talking about some kind of hierarchy? Yeah? Someone's at the top and someone's at the bottom. Yeah? So the only, so the only reason I picked that up is, I don't know who did it, but someone made the assertion that they all have equal weight. It, it, it doesn't matter. I would, so all I want to point out is that whatever this issue is about humanity, they don't, hold, they don't all hold equal weight. There's a hierarchical system in a man, because there's higher and lower things. Yeah? So all I want to pick up here, and we're going to close, is that the nature of man is threefold at one level, but it's also twofold at another level. And it's the lower and the higher powers. So we've, we've skimmed through this, but it's a robust model. It's not, even though it might, you might think I've just picked up two phrases out of that. It talks about lower passions, higher passion, powers, and in other places she'll use the word powers here. Lower powers and higher powers. So we've got higher powers and lower And all I want us to see is that at one level, the nature of man is threefold, and at one level, the nature of man is twofold. And it's the same problem that we have here. I think Sister Shamila said, I, don't, I can't remember how she phrased it, but she said, a number of people did, like the servants of the wheat, and the fishermen of the good fish, and Jeremiah is the precious, and the man with the ink horn, would we say it's a sign in crying? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Do we agree with that? Mm -hmm. the hundred Did anybody disagree? One, two, three, four testimonies. So if, if that's correct, who are the 11 disciples then? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, in, in the model itself. Mm -hmm. Who are the 11 disciples? Mm -hmm. Christ? Mm -hmm. We, we kind of said that a bit muted. <laughs> <laughs> So Christ is them, and they are Christ. Right. Yeah. yeah? So people have problems, because nobody objected when, when they said it strongly. Servants of the wheat and the wheat of the servants, the same thing, I think people even were suggesting. But when it came to this one, people were a bit more <laughs> reticent to say they're the same thing. Yes. 
Yeah, can we say that? They're the same thing. Christ and the eleven are the same thing. Two different symbols for one thing. Christ is a symbol, isn't he? Yeah? Okay, so all I want to show us here is that there's this three and this two. And you see it in the nature of man. There's this threefold nature and it's this twofold nature as well. If, if you like schematics, you know, we could do this this way. The everlasting gospel is how many steps? One, two, three steps, and it's in two sections. It, it's, it doesn't really make much sense. It doesn't teach you anything, I don't think, but it's just kind of a... I don't know what it does for you, but... This one you can demonstrate is correct. You've got three and two, and we're going to begin to see Adventist home is that you've got the higher and lower powers, and you have to deal with that when it comes to the issue of the threefold nature of man. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care over us. We ask and pray that you would be with us, guide us and bless us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and continue to do for your people here on earth. And as each of us are challenged by our own weaknesses, our own humanity, our own preconceived ideas, we thank you, Lord, that you are doing a work here on earth where you will transform us so that we can and will have the mind of Christ, that we will think and feel just the same way that you do. Let this be our prayer and our meditation. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.